OK, so the outcome was that we can compute a linearization of our measurement operator. And to do that, we need to solve a differential equation. OK, that's nice. But uh, for Kutchmarts, we need the adjoint. And the question is, what is the adjoint? And uh, to compute that, first uh, let omega be the strip between L1 and L2. Then um, if I apply uh, the third Green's formula to that strip for any u and any v, where's my mouse? For any u and v, we have that the integral over omega uh, Laplacian of u times v minus u times the Laplacian of v dx is the integral over the boundary of omega. So that's the that's L1 and L2. Uh, du over d mu times v minus u times dv over d mu. And that's d sigma. So that's the surface measure um, in uh, R2. Because, of course, we're looking at everything in R2. Uh, so it's the same setting as uh, for the inverse scattering problem in the last chapter. OK, um, now I can slightly rewrite the left-hand side and add a k squared times q u v and subtract it. So I can also write this as delta u plus k squared times 1 plus q u times v minus u times delta v plus k square 1 plus q times v dx. Nothing happened here. I just inserted this k square q, uh, k square 1 plus q times u times v and subtracted it, and that's all. OK, um, now um, R prime, um, that's an operator that maps from image space to measurement space, right? It's a linearization of the measurement operator. So that goes from image space to measurement space. Now we're looking for the adjoint. And uh, so that should be in the opposite direction. So, so uh, we, that should be an operator from measurement space to image space. So more or less, that's from G, where the data lives, to Q, that's where the image lives. OK, um, so uh, which um, equation does the adjoint have to satisfy? Well, we need that R prime of Q, the linearization that we had up there, times dQ, applied to dQ, a scalar product with G, and that's in measurement space should be the same as dq times r prime of q, I should say here, adjoint uh, times g. And um, of course, this is all in measurement space. So uh, this is the integral over the boundary of omega. And um, yeah, this, this is in uh, image space. So that should be in omega. That's an integral over omega. OK, um, now I apply the formula that I just wrote down here. And uh, specifically, I set u equal to du. Now, um, since uh, du is all, uh, du tilde, excuse me, u equal to du tilde. And du tilde is almost a solution to the uh, to the Helmholtz equation. Uh, only delta u plus k delta du tilde plus k square one plus q times du tilde is not zero. Um, it's what did I write up here? It is uh, minus k square times u times dq. Okay. So if I set u equal to d u tilde, then this here is equal to minus k squared times u times dq. OK, and uh, this is multiplied with v minus du, I said u equal to du times, and, I, and the rest I completely leave out. So this is delta v plus k squared times 1 plus q times v times dx, dx not times dx. OK, and uh, of course, on the right hand side, we have the integral of the boundary of omega. So that's the integral 
over L1 plus the integral over L2, but uh, due to the boundary conditions of du tilde, we see that uh, the, all the integrals over L1 vanish. So all that's left is the integrals over L2, and that's the integral over L2, d over d mu, uh, du tilde, that's this one over here, times v, minus du tilde times dv over d mu times, uh, times d sigma. And uh, again, all I did here was I replaced u with du, otherwise that's just Green's formula. Okay, um, remember what was du tilde on L2? That was actually our r prime of q times dq. Okay, now that looks great because uh, this is the integral over L2, r prime of q times dq uh, times some function dv over d mu. That looks very much like what we want to have. Huh? This is very much like this one over here. So how can we make the right-hand side look like what we want to have? Well, we, uh, we still haven't specified what v is. So we might choose v in the following way. Um, let, uh, first of all, let v on uh, the, um, on l2, set v equal, uh, on, set v on l2 equal to zero. So the first one over here vanishes. And I think there's a minus sign missing over here. Um, if I set dv over d mu on L2 equal to mean minus g, then this is nothing but the integral over L2, uh, g times r prime of q times dq. And um, that means that uh, this is nothing but the scalar product of r prime of q times dq and g, and that's exactly what we have over here. So that's great. Um, now for the left-hand side. Um, of course, we want this one over here. I mean, this one looks already quite nice, right? We want to have something like integral over uh, omega dq times r prime of q times g. Now, of course, this one over here um, looks very much like what we want to have, right? There's al already the integral over omega, there's already the dq over here, and maybe we could just define that our, uh, that our prime adjoint as v times k squared times u, and then everything would be fine. Yeah. Um, however, um, there's this nasty guy over here, and, uh, but we didn't specify, we didn't get specified V inside omega. We only specified V on the boundary up to now. So we just uh, specify V as the solution to the following, to the Helmholtz equation. So delta V plus K squared times one plus Q times V equals zero. And if that's the case, then this one over here just drops completely. And all we have now, plugging in this definition of V, we have that the integral over omega dq times minus k squared u times v, which is nothing but uh, uh, dx, excuse me, is the same as the integral over L2. We already saw this one with our definition of v, this one drops. This one over here is r prime of q times dq, so uh, times dq. Um, uh, and uh, this one has been chosen as g. And so this is the scalar product of r prime of q times dq and g. If I define this over here as r prime of uh, r prime adjoint of q times g, then this is also the scalar product that r k prime adjoint should satisfy. So this is yeah, this is the one. So this is the one that it should satisfy, and it does. So um, that's the proper definition of R prime adjoint of Q times G. Okay, um, let me mention, um, of, course, of course, this has to be linear. Uh, so uh, the question is, is it actually, well, you can easily see that V depends on G in a linear way. Uh, this is the definition of V and uh, then V depends on G linearly. So also this 
operator down here is linear, so everything absolutely makes sense. Okay, um, now what do we have to do to compute the adjoint? Uh, let's com go back to the original problem. Now, to, for the forward operator, for the measurement operator, we had an initial value problem down here and we propagated through the object. And uh, now for getting the adjoint, for doing the inversion, uh, we, need to do the other, we need to do it the other way around. We're getting an initial value problem that starts at L2. Remember that V started at, at an initial values uh, 0 and G on L2. So we need to somehow backpropagate in a way. So, um, I mean, we started with uh, something that was a little bit radon-like. And uh, again, what we see now is that it is radon-like. Um, we have something like a projection. And to get the inversion, we, we need to do something like back projection. And that's very close, actually, to what we did in Kachmarts for the, uh, for the radon transform. So the similarity transforms to, um, to inverse scattering. And uh, there's even one thing, I think I forgot to mention that. Um, one nice thing about the radon transform, very nice thing about the radon transform is that it is an inverse problem. It is an Ill, uh, Ill proper, improperly posed problem, but it's very mildly improperly posed and we proved that. And we now see that for the inverse scattering problem, there are a lot of similarities between uh, the um, inverse problem uh, and uh, the inversion, inversion of the scattering problem and the inversion of the radon transform. And luckily, that also transfers. So uh, also the problem of inverse scattering is not too improperly posed. And uh, so um, generally, it is possible to uh, generate nice images, uh, even with uh, noisy data. However, the measurement of data in inverse scattering is unfortunately much, much more difficult. And uh, that's, that's the problem here. And that's why, by the way, that's why the company went broke, uh, where I uh, showed you the, uh, the video last time. Um, the thing is that um, it was just very, very difficult and proved to be too difficult to measure the data in a um, satisfactory way. Okay, so uh, that was it for this semester. Uh, not completely because we'll have a lecture on Thursday that will be done uh, live and uh, I think it will be something like 45 minutes where I will tell you something uh, about inverse problems. I will just rehearse the whole lecture in uh, in an hour and I will tell you what I really think is, is important, what you should keep in mind from the lecture.